Okay. Subset localization. There are, let's begin with words. Uh, there are three different terms bihomology, de novo, ab initio. Anybody in the room can tell me with the background of subset localization, of predicting subset localization, how you would apply those terms? Or anything, any problem that you know about protein prediction? Anybody goes for any term? You all should go at least for, for the first one. Is it so, yeah, Maria? Yeah, um, like with biomology, find um, proteins that are very um, closely related to the protein and then kind of infer um, that they are probably sub so subcellular localized, probably in the same localization. So. Through the evolutionary connection. That's the idea. So there's one protein that is evolutionary related for which you have experimental data. Can she reach? Uh, See one? I, yeah, I no. Don't know. Good. She tries. She, she tries. <laughs> That's good enough. <laughs> she can do that for the next two hours. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, this means there is another protein that has an experimental annotation for which you believe that the relation exists because of the evolutionary collection. Okay? Yes, it's sequence similar. Uh, but you believe that the sequence similarity, similarity reveals, sorry for that, uh, come, yes, I'm sorry, thank you, that was, I'm sorry, a uh, clever, clever way of reacting to that, anything out of the way. Uh, de novo, a new would be the translation for that, and essentially the idea is you take a bunch of proteins for which you know the subset organization, and you discover something in their sequences. And from that, seeing that sequence signal again, by machine learning, for instance, you infer subcellular localization. So the moment you infer subcellular localization, you may not say it's that protein. By homology, it's that protein that you infer the subcellular location, or several, as Maria said. Uh, de novo, it could be a signal that has somehow spread over 10, 100 proteins, right? But it's still something that is in those 100. It's something that, by machine learning, you learned. Up in issue is from first principles. And there, really, the idea would be you can write on an equation. Newton's law or something like that. An equation that really tells you this is the subset of causation x and y. Uh, it could be, so we briefly discussed the issue of hydrophobicity and charges. It could be that there is a simple equation that relates the charge to subset of causation. Why could that be the case? It's not the case, but why could you suspect that some that, that charge or hydrophobicity may play a role? Since they are empty, this is another acceptable way. Oh no, this one we can play, but not this one. <laughs> so why could, yeah? For example, in, in membrane proteins. Yeah. There's uh, less hydrophobic uh, protein because they're like fatty. Exactly. So you could distinguish between a membrane protein and a non membrane protein by some overall hydrophobicity charge, uh, charge uh, feature. Um, anything else you could think about? Any other reason? So, subset organization, different compartments. Do you know anything about different compartments? Uh, for example, with pH and then the lysosome, for example. So, they have slightly different pH values, yes. So there's the environmental condition in different compartments is slightly different. And that could be visible in the protein, right? Uh, okay, the problem on, this, on the level of the prokaryotes, essentially what you distinguish is, are you inside, are you outside, uh, and there are ribosomes, there are things that we may identify, a temporary machines in there that we may recognize, flagellum, uh, but typically most methods really do a, like two states and then there are different bacteria that have two different la layers of membrane. For the eukaryote, the story is more complicated, we have more compartments. For today's lecture, mostly I will have a simple model in which we have inside of a cell, the nucleus and the extracellular space. Again, there is more to it. Uh, and I will gloss over that, essentially. There is a sorting pathway 
proteins are expressed at the ribosomes, there's a gated transport to the nucleus, and then there's sort of the blue here, the secretory pathway. So proteins that go to the secretory pathway are destined, have something in common. Um, and we'll get back to that in a minute. There are different ways in which we can predict subset localization. We can use sequence similarity, that's homology, we talked about that, I will briefly bring that back. Text similarity, motifs, uh, structure and sequence, de novo. So let's begin there. We talked about that. So when things are very similar, most likely they have the same subset localization. You, in order to predict, uh, uh, to see how well subset localization can be predicted by homology, you look at a data set of all proteins of known localization. You take out uh, your sequence unique subset. You do sequence unique subsets against all to reduce bias. You cannot do sequence unique against sequence unique. Why? Because you won't find anything. Exactly. So for homology, by homology means you have to have homology. By definition, sequence unique means there is, if you pair that set, there is zero. So you cannot do much. So you have to accept some bias. Bias is homology. Uh, and essentially it tries from the sequence to infer that their protein here in this particular case is nuclear. Uh, you can use percentage sequence identity. You can use the h value, the distance from this curve here. Um, and then you can use a, a and, and p value. We talked about that last week. Um, that's the p value here, or e value, and then for all of that, you can define uh, an accuracy. Uh, Psi blast works a little bit better. Um, and we sh I showed you these curves. Um, now, oh, I wanted to get into a level of detail. Oh, so at some point, I have a curve. Uh, and these curves in blue here shows in the p-value, here the h-value, how well I can infer subcellular localization through homology. Okay? Say you had established these thresholds. And then typically the way you use them, you say, okay, I, I define some threshold, and above, I, if I find anything above, I say that I infer subcellular localization. Right? Maybe I can also give a probability for that assignment, but in principle that's the kind of thing you would do. Now, then you would sort of um, publish this threshold, these findings, what else would you publish? So at that point, and we came to that point last week, I showed you how sequence similarity relates to the ability to predict by homology essentially localization. You publish the curves, you publish the probability values, uh, and that is a paper. What else could you do in that paper? But that's what you look at. So you have done that on basically the data of all proteins of known subset localization. You have a tool that you believe can infer by homology. How would you use that tool? Well, the first thing is you would try to see what it actually brings. So far, we are in a controlled environment. But at least in this, uh, in, in this, in this publication, uh, yeah, I really don't know what, what she has today. Uh, so in this publication, you claim that you have a tool that does homology-based inference. Apply it. What could you apply it to? Yeah? Yeah. Which one would you apply it to? Uniprot? Um, yeah. Then your supervisor would say, well, there's a lot of protein. <laughs> um, yeah? Uh, like if you use the training set from Uniprot, and then, for example, you choose the newest 50. That's a great idea. So you, you, you went back essentially for publications of something that is not in Uniprot, that is not annotated in databases. You just took the latest uh, one month or two months. <laughs> That's a great idea. This, 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 is, this idea you should always somehow find a way to realize. And your project, that may sound a little bit different, but some of it is always a great addition to, to any publication you have. Maria? Um, yeah, or maybe also those that don't have um, experimentally um, um, assigned geoterms or something yeah. that weren't really experimentally. Um, True, it's still a big number in Uniprot. With, with 80, 80, 80 million is still... Are those without Yeah, it's still, it's still uh, 40 million. Okay, you halved it. But half, 
half of 80 million is still a big number. Uh, well, you know, the simplest thing is you take something that, uh, oops, entire organisms, for instance, right? Back, and those are old numbers here. But you, you look at human. What does it bring? So I have a new method. How much does my method add today to, you, to the annotation? Oh, the annotation of human, sorry. Uh, annotation of human or... or well. uh, so the annotation of different entirely sequenced organisms. Uh, and what I, what I show here is how much is annotated already by SwissProt? How much is added by this similar to SwissProt? Uh, and this is something that we get in a moment uh, too. And how much is left unknown. Uh, and it shows you two things here, just uh, for, for human in particular. Uh, for yeast, the story is slightly different, but it shows you that there is very little directly annotated today, and that the blue helps a lot compared to the green, but it also shows you that there is a lot of white. Right? Uh, but it gives you some idea, so maybe your annotation is wrong, but you gave an estimate for how much of it is right, depending on your threshold. And it gives you an annotation how much help will this tool actually bring, right? And it's very, very easy to do. In principle, you could have done it for Uniport, but this is less controlled. Uh, and going for some specific organisms, you in fact also see other things. You see that in fact this distribution is very different between organisms. And this in fact is, again these numbers are outdated, uh, but this is something that you, that you expected. F most experiments for subset organization are done in yeast. That's why the green part in yeast is very high. And for yeast, Human annotations, human experiments, for, uh, experiments from human proteins hardly help, ever help in yeast because if you can, you did it in yeast. Uh, so that's why the blue is relatively little there. Uh, so you see a lot of things that make sense. So essentially you, you publish something that has a new value in that tool. And you should always try to do something like that. So read some new papers and do, do some new perspective. Uh, I'd like to next work into the text similarity story. What I mean is the following. And as work from Rajesh Nair here. Uh, this is a typical Swiss Park record where you have the functional annotation, you have something about the subunits, there's an organism taxonomy, uh, and here's the subset of localization. Now assume that I remove this, the blue. Could you guess the blue? Could you guess that it's nuclear? Can you read it? I'm sorry. The, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. So, everybody can somehow read some words? Anybody an idea? Sorry? The TTTC found like ERE2 recognition site TTT, second line of the function. TTTC. So this tells you it's nucleus. Yeah, from biochemistry class. <laughs> Good. That is certainly true. Uh, there's nothing simpler. Binds DNA. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. This is DNA, but this is <laughs> okay. Um, yes, nuclear proteins bind DNA. In fact, uh, the the processing. No, she's just playing with her imagined toys. Uh, so this gives it away for experts that this is nuclear protein and in the same way uh, chromatin regulator would give it away, blood uh, coagulation would give it away as a secreted protein. Now our goal is to essentially use those keywords here to toward two ends. And number one is we discover what is trivial for experts. But maybe not trivial for everybody. So you had to have take a biochemistry class. If you hadn't taken that, if you wouldn't know that DNA binding is nucleus, can a machine learn that? Right? That's the first goal. The second goal is are there non-obvious correlations that are such that if you see these five keywords, the combination of the five is relevant for the subset localization. But just seeing one of them, you cannot tell. Okay? So how would you do that? So you want essentially to use the keywords in, for instance, a Swiss port record, for cases for which in that Swiss port record you don't have the localization. So infer it from functional annotation. How would you do that? <laughs> 
and I allow you to use, so it's not really text mining in, the, in that sense because I have a controlled vocabulary, Swiss broad keywords. There's a, no. There's a limited set of keywords uh, that I used to annotate Um, yeah. <laughs> Any idea? Uh, is it regular, regular expressions? Regular expressions for keywords? Yeah. I can. How is that? How would you do that? Uh, look in, in the unit pro database with, for example, Python script and then use the regular expressions in it. In sequence or in keywords? Regular expression for a keyword. A regular expression of a keyword. So DNA binding would be a regular expression or? Yeah. Yes. But then, then if you say that, then the word, what's the difference between yeah. saying keyword and regular expression? So you want a couple of keywords. Yeah, Essentially, are you, are you trying to have mo <coughs> motifs, so to speak, of keywords? Is that what you have in your heads? Uh, but it's a great yeah, point. Okay. DNA binding. You would essentially have DNA and binding and would merge it. Yes, that's an idea and we didn't follow that. Uh, that's an idea. In fact, we didn't do that. Uh, by the way, let's, let's just begin. We need some data set of proteins for which we uh, know subset localization and with which we know the keywords. And overall, we extract keywords and then we get to these keywords. Uh, but how would you? That would be one way. It's not the way we used it. Can, can create a word occurrence for each article and retrain as we are on networks. No, this is not machine learning. Just, just in a much simpler way. Uh, yes. Well, actually, machine learning sort of is going in the. Oh God! This is. No, no, it's, today is the day. Many of you may not remember that as children, but we all went through these phases. <laughs> Funny enough, it started this morning. So, uh, there's that. Luckily, we can still do that, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, now with my, where do I have my, ah. How can we use those in a non-machine learning sense, in a, in a sort of trick? How can we use keywords, yes? So the thing you can do is count. Yeah, what? Count what? I mean, we know, uh, for example, uh, if you have a nuclear protein, and for each nuclear protein we find, it binds DNA, then we can, how many times we find binds DNA for nuclear proteins in comparison to the whole database? Okay, so in principle, we do something like this. So we have for every single protein, we have a bunch, we have a vector of keywords, uh, and for every single protein, we have the one and zero. Is the keyword present or not? So this is not, but in this particular case, DNA binding is a, is a keyword, and we're not discovering motifs. We're just looking at the overall number, the overall count. Uh, now, what's the immediate problem that you see with that, if you, if you look at this record? If it's anything, it's non DNA binding, do you have DNA binding? Yes. If it is non, so yes, oh no, that's an additional problem. That, that's a, uh, yes, that, that, yes, that's a very good problem. Uh, that's a very, very good point. Yes, you cannot, uh, great point. So, you cannot just naively d chop up these words. You have to use some uh, recognition of non-negation. Um, true. And I haven't, hadn't thought about that. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Cherry. Cherry. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, but there's another issue. Just numbers, right? So we have 15,000 Swiss broad records. I don't know, these are 50 words, 100 words. 15,000, uh, it's big, big and sparse. Uh, but just looking at this record, you may sum over word that of a 
So there are tons of words in there, but absolutely not informative. Number. Uh, we immediately know, reading this, uh, that these words will not help us. So there are more and less informative words here. So we, we should filter by something that is totally non-informative. What could we do? Define the vocabulary once again. Uh, hmm? Just limit your vocabulary. How? Well, how could you kick out words like that? Information content. Information content, yes. Uh, but we have to be careful with that. Uh, if, if, so for instance, the word binding most likely will happen everywhere. We don't want to kick out binding. In some sense, we would have to get into understanding words for that one. Uh, did you want to say more? No? Uh, so, the simplest way here really would be to use a sort of an English, an English language dictionary or, or common English words and kick those out. Uh, so, something that uh, I can't remember how we did it, but you, you run it against Shakespeare, anything that you find in Shakespeare, you kick out, or something like that, right? Uh, and that essentially handled most of it. Again, we want to keep some words that are in all three subset organizations, we want to keep them. That can have uh, informative uh, content. Uh, and I will show you one of those later. Now, that allows us to essentially build a data set of the safe 1,000 keywords that are relative, relevant by entropy uh, and we map them to the three subset localizations. How can I use this database now if I come in with a new protein to classify it in either of those three? So this is the observed vector set. I come with my new protein. How do I predict Either of these three states. Can I go the distance in quantum? I mean, like non-machine learning, right? About well, distance? How can you do, forget about machine learning? So can you can you combine a distance measure without machine learning? No, no, you don't want machine learning solution. Right? No, but you distances you, you would up. <laughs> so. So you can put the average of, of each set, and then you see that which one. But how can you find a distance? A simple distance. Uh, you can you could do. You have two Euclidean distance of two vectors. Yeah. What's the problem with that? High dimension. <laughs> yeah, that's not the only problem. There's another problem with that. Any idea? So the point is that most Swiss word records will not, be the comp will not be complete. So whatever functional annotation you find will not be the functional annotation you find in 10 years from now. It's incomplete because essentially these database records grow. Uh, essentially the experimental data increases. That means that in particular, so there will be errors. That's one problem. But so some of the ones that we have are incorrect ones. But the more important problem is that a lot of the zeros should be will become ones. But you want to make a decision today. How can you account for that? That there are many keywords that you don't have in your data set or in your database or in your new prediction because the protein is not entirely annotated. Any idea? Well, maybe the remainder of the lecture I do from down there. Uh, you essentially look at all possible subvectors. So you turn, you, you essentially flip the bin for many of those. Uh, and for each of those, you compile some, some entropy. And you hope that the clauses in the database is going to still be the right one. I mean, ultimately, it's clear that the method will not work. If you essentially have only two keywords and you flip, not much will be left. Or it will be too inspecific. But if you have a substantial number of keywords, this may or may not. So she will try to bite through that. And anyway, so the idea is essentially I, I create all possible subvectors and I hope that in these subvectors, the right hit suddenly scores up against my classification database. Uh, score up, I do a simple Shen entropy uh, and pick out the right vector from this. Um, 
These are some of the correlations that this uh, device di di discovered. So uh, some of those are indicative, but the combination of these keywords, 3D, uh, in fact here you see that this particular combination is highly non-trivial, either of those two is not enough. Uh, this one would be enough here, or maybe enough, but again also proteins from outside the nucleus are related to cell division. Um, this is essentially a DNA binding protein related to that. Uh, and then there are some correlations that in fact are wrong mistakes because of errors in the database. Uh, now, one thing is, so here's the distribution of keywords, here's the number of keywords, uh, and the accuracy in some sense, uh, this, is, this is the incorrect label here. The accuracy goes up, so this should read accuracy, and that should read coverage, so the accuracy goes up. Uh, with the number of keywords, so the fewer keywords you have, the less accurate your method works. The more keywords you have, the better. And then there is some effect of saturation, where simply you don't you don't have enough counts. Ultimately, uh, it's a random background effect. This is the coverage in blue. Again, this is wrong here, uh, and that. Uh, <laughs> This essentially is a, is a random effect in the background effect here that we see. Uh, now, in the method that I have so far, it says that my best matching vector in the subvector database is one that is nuclear. I could also ask, what about the second best hit? Okay, and what you see here, and now accuracy and coverage are the right words here. Blue, how well do I do in just getting the top hit right? Red, how well do I do in getting one of the two top hits right? I don't know which one. I'm just asking, is the right one in, in the top two? Okay? Uh, and my question to you, is that better? Is the red better than the blue? Just like developing a number into it's better, but then you wait a minute. Be careful. When we're looking at numbers, what we see numerically, red is higher than blue. Yeah. Does that mean it's better? Exactly. I mean, just by the number, it seems better, but then you consider two hits, right? So if we, you reduce, you increase probability by two. That's the important point. Okay. Is everybody clear about that point? So again, in a three-state system. The first hit is 33% random, right? And these, the blue is clearly, absolutely clearly matching or uh, uh, in excess of 33%. Now, the red one is 66 random. And you see that the red one is clearly above 66. But that is not the question. The question is, how much do I add between red and blue? And what I add the red one is higher, yes, but the amount that I add, that is no longer clearly better than random. So I'm not adding 33%. I'm not adding anything that is near what going from uh, random being first hit, random 33, to two top hits at random 66. That is not what I'm adding. So in that sense, oh, so she can reach you? Yeah. <laughs> she likes my shoes, apparently. Then we can also get her a little bit further away. <laughs> Today you stay. Oh, meanwhile you have completely. Uh -huh. Let's try this one now. Ah. I'm also not that dumb. Don't count me out of this. Um, so she cannot reach you anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah, she has never experienced that in her life. And I'm sorry that I take the time to observe her behavior on it. Um, anyway, so although it appeared as if the red one clearly did buy your brownie points here. It did not live up to the numbers. Okay? And again, sometimes looking at random is not enough because the red is better than random. 
And by that count alone, you would have said, okay, better. Uh, but you also, in this particular case, have to really look at the differential. So the red does not add, so the first hit really is the signal. Why that is the case and why the red adds so little, uh, part of that may be answered in the fact that the, the, the blue is relatively high here. So there's not that much gain that you can possibly have. Uh, part of it is ultimately most of, of what happens here, why this is not a, uh, a more, more impressive gain, is unclear to me. The first hit somehow stands out. There's a slightly different signal for different subcellularizations. And again, it can discover things that are non-trivial. Now, once you have that method, you can use keywords to predict subcellularization whenever the Swiss record doesn't have that. How can you see how well that does? So again, the, the, the performance we, we have estimated. How can you, in your publication of that method, do one on top? You can look at, again, what Neil said before applies here as well. Take the latest publications from last month, last year, or something like that, and see how much you discover. That is one way of doing it. Uh, what else could you do? Again, in the this, in this same spirit that I used before. And I'm sorry for that. Yes. What could you do? In the same sense in, in which we did before, uh, you simply can ask with this method, how many would you identify? Uh, in particular, organisms. So, Abdopsis, uh, uh, he is human. Uh, and what you see is by homology, you just the mere number. By homology, you can uh, pick up about 6,000. By this keyword, you can pick 10,000. So you see that, in fact, it is more powerful for the annotation. There's some overlap. So we did not re uh, remove the overlap here. Uh, but the mirror numbers are impressive. So this, this keyword is a relatively simple method that you can essentially program in a time uh, if you're focused enough that is a bachelor thesis, or certainly a master thesis, was, so it took Rajesh much less, but he was also more experienced at that time. Uh, and it is a method that in fact covers a lot in terms of genome, in fact even covers more than can be done by homology-based inference, which is typically what people use. And not only that, it's even more accurate. Uh, and again, when you look at the the pie for the entire switchboard here, uh, where at that point when we did this, half of the switchboard still was unannotated in terms of subcellularization. But the major fraction of the entire annotation, so this is experimental down here, 10% roundabout. The lock key, the keyword base, adds twice as much. This is what homology adds again, right? So this is uh, a very impressive way in which you can see how much your tool contributes for annotation. Uh, and it's relatively easy to do that at the end of the day. Um, now, uh, yeah? If there's an overlap between homology and log tree, this figure just doesn't work out, right? Uh, so the, the, like it is removed, it must have been removed. I think it's Before, well, no, here, here it was not removed, yeah. but here it is removed. And so on this one here, on the, on the genome side, here the redundancy is re removed. Uh, and that's what I already showed you before, where I said that blue is much higher than green, and I had not really focused on the on the red. This is the same here, zoomed into right this maxis at the at the max point here, and you see how much the red uh, keyword based annotation is with respect to the blue. Okay, now here's a different story, the motif story. Uh, there are two types of motifs we typically think about: motifs that are sequential. So looking at a sequence, you recognize the motif. It's motifs that are so-called conformational. Conformational means that if it comes together on the three-dimensional structure, here you see a patch of red. But if you roll it out, you have two patches, and you would not recognize those two patches as motifs. Uh, you could try to identify these kinds of motifs by uh, looking at sequence alignments and see what is conserved. And from the conservation, conservation conserved columns, you can read off these motifs. Uh, but now, again, this is the, uh, the way in which 
proteins are sorted in the cell. And here's the secretory pathway. The secretory pathway is in one sense specific and, or special, and that's the story of the signal peptide. Uh, so secretory pathway, again, or proteins that go out of the cell. Uh, signal is essentially a word for motif. Peptide is part of the protein. It goes back to Gunnar van Heijen, who sort of did the early work on the signal peptides. Uh, at Stockholm University. Uh, Gunnar is on the Nobel Prize Committee here announcing the Nobel Prize in 2008 in chemistry. Uh, and so he worked on transmembrane prediction, that's essentially a field he started, uh, and got into signal peptides because signal peptides often uh, are in, also inserted as a membrane helix. The other person who came is Søren Brunak, who, and this is no longer his main association, is now at the uh, main university in, in uh, Copenhagen uh, and another giant in the field so this is six years ago age index has grown and the third person in the game here is Henrik Nielsen essentially he collected all the data so when you have all the data and that led to uh, these kind of specifications you see that signal peptides are typically and terminal so the beginning of the protein they're typically 15 to 30 residues long. So collecting the data is you collect a lot of experimental evidence for signal peptides, and then you compare them. Uh, and those are things he, they, they found. They are cleaved, so this we know. Uh, they exist in three kingdoms, and they have a simple architecture. The architecture is there's an N region uh, with charge, often charged. Uh, H region is hydrophobic, the H stands for hydrophobic here, that's internal at the beginning, uh, typically longer than six residues. There is a sort of cleavage region that's often polar and uncharged, and there's a cleavage site. Do you know what the cleavage site is of a signal peptide? So we have a gene. The exon is translated into a protein, and the protein does its work, right? And that will be the protein forever. Is that true? No, because there's post-translation and modification. And that is one particular post-translation modification. So everything up to that point is cleaved off. The protein is uh, expressed in the cell. What is this site used for? Do you happen to know? Yeah. Um, for example, once it's uh, reached its destination, or it's going through a membrane tunnel, it, um, the, cleavage, uh, the signal peptide is cleaved off. So. Yes, well, exactly. So ultimately you have part of the protein uh, sequence and some proteins are relatively short. So this can be up to 50 residues long, can be a substantial part of the protein. In fact, it can be a third of the length of the protein. The shortest proteins are about 100 residues, as you know. Uh, and so one third is essentially there only to bring it somewhere. And will not be used for the rest of the life, right? This is essentially a signal peptide. Uh, many of them are cleaved. And now, if you had this simple architecture, how could you use that to devise a prediction method? You can focus on cleavage right? because it's indicative of the location. So you can divert. Uh, let me just uh, uh, use what you said before. Uh, take, train a machine learning device on cleavage side. Yes, that's one thing. But there's more to it. Let me show you a different way in which uh, you can see that there is more to it. Uh, so you align with respect to the cleavage side uh, position one is the the cleavage site, and then you simply count for gram positive, gram negative, and eukaryotes. What amino acids do you see? So the height of the amino acid is proportional to the occurrence of that amino acid. So you see a lot of L's, here you see A, G, S. Uh, so essentially you see a profile with respect before the cleavage site. How can you use that profile to predict? again, prior to machine learning. How can you turn that into something that you are very well familiar with, I assume? It's like a psi bias profile, right? You can essentially translate these counts directly into a psi bias profile, and then you can simply align, using even psi blast, 
using essentially these profiles, blast, psi blast against the database, uh, and pick out everything that fits that motif. In that sense, the motif here is not, it is not short, it is in the order of 30 residues. So you simply find a 30, 30 consecutive residue bit piece uh, that fits to this probability. Okay, now what else could you do? More sort of machine learning. Psyblast is the simplest thing you can do. Anything that is sort of also relatively simple but one level up and uses somehow machine learning work. Essentially, you have, uh, you have a probability for, for going through certain states. H yeah. Typic. It's just the, the typical problem that you address with HMMs. Uh, and in fact, they, they did all of those, and the HMMs here worked best for them. Uh, then later, they added a couple of other things. Meanwhile, there's, there's plenty uh, of more tools, but ultimately, signal P, as it is called, and the others are still the, the major tools out there. There's a problem with membrane prediction, as some of you may be aware of. So the membrane prediction methods very often make big, so this is sort of the error rates for non proteins without single peptides. Okay, so some old membrane methods get it very, very often wrong, but the better methods somehow have low error rate, but for proteins with single peptides, almost everybody has a problem. And there are some methods that essentially use single peptides and membrane at the same time. Uh, and this is because uh, single peptides look like membrane helices. Uh, those are methods here, Phobius and Spoktokopus, that essentially combine these two. And that's one issue. Now, are there other signals like single peptides? So these are for secretion. Is anybody aware of it? something like that? In a different uh, for a different compartment? Is that similar? What do you know about local localization signals? There is an NLS, and we will talk about that in a minute. Uh, but is it similar? Yeah? I think there has to be some sequence which is bound by the they are called a protein complex or something, and they transported the nucleus. Yes, we will get that's the ultimately the NLS signal. Uh, we will get to that in a moment, and that actually is very different. I will uh, I will explain that in a minute. Uh, yes, there are two different types that are essentially exactly the same thing. They just because of biology have different names: uh, transit peptides and chloroplasts, targeting peptides of mitochondria. They are the same, not because the same device can predict them. You already see there are three different publications here, but they are the same in the sense they are all N-terminal. They all have a similar architecture, so they have a hydrophobic region, they have a cleavage site. Uh, in that sense, they are all the same. Okay? And you can de 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 derive methods that predict them. There are other motifs, uh, and I don't want to get into those because ultimately they didn't work very well. Um, here is the next success story, and that's the nuclearization signal that uh, Neil's already, uh, Neil already briefly alluded to. So again, there are two types of zip codes that we can imagine, the sequence and the uh, confirmation, so that we only we needed a structure for doing that. But the NLS is such that if your protein has a nuclear localization signal, this is recognized. Here are two types of protein, so-called importing, transporting, that recognizes the NLS signal, takes the protein, shuttles it, shuttles it through the pore, puts it into the nucleus. Okay? Now, when we started our work, there's a data, there was a database of uh, protein sequence motifs, ProSide, that contained one NLS. That NLS matched to 96 nuclear proteins from 30 different or 31 different families. 90% of the proteins that had known localization that it matched were nuclear proteins. 3% of all the nuclear proteins that were known at the time were matched by it. So this sounds like nuclearization signal is exactly a signal that works. Now what makes it different from the signal peptides is there is no rule. At least that's what people believed. It's not N-terminal. It's anywhere in the sequence. It's not C-terminal. Anywhere in the sequence. We don't quite know much about it. Somehow, let's call it a success story, and let's assume that I gave you the bachelor or master thesis to build upon that success story. Find more of those. How would you do that? 
So look for new databases, yes, but it didn't work. In those days, really, ProSide was the only resource that had any of these motifs other than Google. So essentially, look at the literature. Uh, and Murat Shokol did exactly that and collected from hundreds of publications, uh, distilled the motifs that experimentalists had characterized. Uh, red means positively charged. Uh, two in this language here, R and K, are the only positively charged residue, two of 20, so 10%, and you immediately see that the red is higher than 10%, 10 uh, in these sequences here. They, you see that they have very different length. You see that they sort of have a lot of red, but in fact the clustering of the red is sort of different. Sometimes there's a long stretch of red, sometimes there's two different stretches of red. Sometimes here, for instance, uh, sometimes there are spaces, sometimes uh, here's another example, sometimes not. Sometimes it's almost everything is red. So they really look very different. This typically, you would argue, this does not look machine learnable at all. At least we argued that way. Uh, here are some more of those. Makes it even more complicated. Uh, so more complicated in the sense there is no simple motif that you can read of and say, well, they're, they're enriched in positively charged. Residues, yes, uh, but sometimes there can be lots of spaces in between, uh, and we get to sort of background probabilities of C2 positively charged residues. Now, they were nuclear localization motifs defined by experimentalists. Let me define the extreme way of a nuclear localization signal. You take a peptide, this one here, I'm not sure this one works. Uh, let me just pick one that, that I know works, this one here, or this one. These two clearly work. You take those two peptides, you put them onto a piece of gold, and gold is imported into the nucleus. Okay? That's how they work. That's the functional explanation. You can really, as long as you tag that to anything, that anything is put into the nucleus. Okay? And the experiments have verified that. Uh, and all of these, in principle, should be like that. Uh, now, we have a set, and there are already some here that look a little bit very, I'm not sure. How could you, in a computer, verify this? So I don't doubt that all of these proteins that carry those motifs have experimentally been verified to be nuclear. I have no doubt that the experimentalist is right. This is not what I'm doubting. What I'm doubting is that uh, this is the reason that if I put that onto gold, then it's going to be in the nucleus. And that, of course, not everybody does. Way too much work. Uh, but how could I sort of find a way to in silico clean up these motifs. Those are the ones I found in the publication. That's the start. What's the next step? How can I clean up? Check it in Swiss Broad. What do you mean check it in Swiss Broad? See whether this motif even occurs there. So this is one, this is, I don't need to see whether it's in Swiss Broad. There's a protein, here's the protein. Uh, and that protein has that motif. It's not the protein name. Yes, it is. It's supposed to be the protein name, but this is a publication. Something went out of uh, of sync here. I'm not sure. But in principle, there's a protein name somewhere. My table is messed up here. Uh, but in principle, there's the protein. Yes. So what can I do? Is it possible that, like, I don't know, like, there are other proteins with this kind of sequence because it's... Yes. How would you check? So well, how would you start? What would you run against? Switch part is not, I would argue, is not what I want to look at. What, what is it that I want to look at? Exactly. The subset in Switch part for which I experimentally know the localization. Okay? Uh, and that is this. Now I have two possibilities. I can map my motif only in the nucleus, or I can map it in nucleus and somewhere else. Okay? Say, <coughs> this motif here maps to nuclear and non-nuclear proteins. What's wrong with the motif then? Yes, there may be an experimental error, but I, I'm not assuming that. I'm only assuming that when they say it's this motif, that may have been wrong. Because they can, in, in those days, people could not every, mutate every single residue. So they did maybe one or two mutations in the protein. That, that was essentially the PhD thesis. Um, so maybe that motif is not right. So how can I, can I say, say, this is the one that is observed in a nuclear and a non-nuclear protein. What would you do to change it? It's very simple, actually. 
Is it not that simple? It's not specific enough. How can you make it more specific? And I really thank you, and somehow your face helps me to know when, when things are simple or not. Thanks for that reaction. I, I need this feedback. Yeah, I didn't want it that way, sorry. Um, more specific, how can I make a motif more specific? It's too Maria? Yeah, you make it longer. But then the so the simplest way is, so if you had enough time to look at a computer, you look at a profile, you look at, you extend it in the direction where you have some conservation. But if not, in the, uh, the simplest thing is you add one residue, or two, or three, in both directions, right? And then you see, uh, well, am I still matching? Now, you could fall into the trap that you make too specific. Too specific means you map it to one particular protein. Ah, it's nuclear, and you never match it into any, any, any other protein. But you also don't match it in any other nuclear protein. That is why we classify these into families, and we require that these motifs match in at least two different families. Meaning that there are at least two proteins that are not sequenced similar to each other. So we could not apply homology-based inference for this, this pair. If I knew A, I couldn't infer the, the localization for B. And yet in both of those I see the signal, and I don't match it in any of the families that are non-nuclear. Okay? Then we construct a set, and we went through several iterations of this, and we really looked at the profile, so we, we did some staring, and we ended up with 214 motifs um, that had 100% accuracy in finding nuclear. Again, that's by, by everything we knew uh, was not nuclear, we made sure that these motifs don't match, so this is trivial. Uh, this is by construction. Um, and we met sort of 40% of the then nuclear proteins. Um, and that was a very, very, very easy thing to do. And again, once you, once you have that, you can apply it to entire organisms and you can see how much new discovery can you get with that motif. And those were the numbers. Uh, and they were remarkable. And also remarkable that we found unannotated proteins that, uh, in fact, were very, very interesting. But here's another thing that we found was interesting. That is the nuclear localization signal. On a protein where we have the three-dimensional side, the three-dimensional structure, what hits you? You see what this thing is doing, right? It binds it into the minor groove, in a uh, major groove uh, of DNA. That's the DNA binding side. So let's, let's just look at the whole thing. So you have a nuclear localization signal, so importing binds to it, you get into the nucleus, importing goes off, and now it binds DNA with the same motif, with the same site. The same site that importing carried in, importing goes away, this is free to bind DNA, DNA bound is done, export in comes and takes it out again. You have one site that is doing this, this cycle and is doing the right function. Unfortunately, or not fortunate, unfortunately, uh, so not all motifs were like that. Several motifs were absolutely not DNA binding. We saw that too. Uh, but it gave us a, a, a handle that was sort of the first large scale, in some sense, in large scale prediction of DNA binding. Um, and again, so is that large scale that is something. Um, that, that, so th these were predicted, so we predicted more proteins to be DNA binding than were known, uh, and many of those in fact were right, uh, but this was sort of a simple DNA binding prediction method. Uh, and again, no, nuclear localization, I'm not showing how much nuclear is visible in here, so, uh, but this all was put together in the whole system. Um, and it predicted subcellular localization. But it did not predict subcellular localization for, f so let's just look at the white part here. Uh, human or whatever organism we looked at, most proteins we could neither do homology, no keyword, no NLS, no signal peptide. Okay? So now we get into the issue of the zip code again. Uh, and Anne somehow brought that up. Uh, it goes back to Günther Blobel, who got a Nobel Prize essentially for this idea that proteins have zip codes. And these zip codes simply regulate the transport. Um, this is what we essentially know for signal peptides. It absolutely works. But they are not known for most of the proteins for which we have localization. Um, 
I'm just happy that this time the noise is not <laughs> not this one here. <laughs> uh, usually I panic when I hear this. <laughs> This hard again. Uh, so why could that be the case? It could be that many, many, many of the signals are just unknown. So they, they remain to be discovered. So we know the localization by an experiment, but we don't know the motif that is responsible for that. We don't know the zip code. Or there's other types of motifs. So far, all the motifs are of the sort of sequential type, even nuclear localization signals. There are spacers, but they are not quite the full-blown conformational motif kind of story. Uh, or there could be other mechanisms. So the zip code idea could be true, yet there is some other mechanism. Could you think about another me mechanism that uses zip codes, but still most protein or many, many, many products of known localization would not have a zip code at all? And somehow still zip codes are relevant? Yeah, it's a complicated story. Uh, so what I'm talking about is this way. So here's my blue protein is the one that has the zip code. And uh, my blue protein binds to the shuttle. And then we go somewhere. This is the cargo. The green protein does not have a zip code. But it binds to the blue. Since blue has the zip code, green essentially gets the same treatment. Simply by binding. Okay? Uh, so then in that model, the hypothesis would be that a lot of the unexplained subset localization is this secondary cargo. So protein-protein interaction. Uh, how can we find all the secondary cargo? How could we estimate whether that is true? So whether, in fact, the known motifs that I have, NLS, signal peptides, transit peptides, and all of these kind of things, uh, along with protein interaction, completely explain the story. How could we figure that out? We would have to estimate, essentially, how many secondary cargo there are. How can we do that? Can you, can you do it now? No. Or how would you do it? Use an assay. Such as what? You, you try to bind all nodes, uh, the zip proteins with all proteins. Exactly. So if we knew all the interacting proteins, we would immediately be able to sort of get back at some numbers and estimate how much of that is the answer. Do we know all proteins? Does anybody have any idea? How many of, say, human has uh, N interactions? What do you believe? How many of these Ns do we know experimentally today? So there is a wild, wild difference in the estimate for these numbers. Uh, but I don't believe many people say more than 20%. So the vast, or the majority, clearly the majority of interactions are unknown. So it's unclear how far we can go with that. Uh, when we first asked these questions, we, the number of known was way too small to even try. Maybe this is something we can, in fact, do now. Uh, while we cannot do that, we clearly need another way to predict for the ones that are left white. So essentially predict subset localization by machine learning. And in the three-state system, nuclear, cytoplasmic, extracellular, the simplest way is machine learning. I give you a data set of proteins that have known localization. You want to predict these three classes. You have sequences. How do you turn your sequences into input? What do you use? We discussed it briefly last week. Profiles? Profiles? No. K-MERS. K-MERS. The simpler, go, go a step simpler. Simpler than K-MERS. K equals one. Oh, essentially amino acid composition, right? Uh, and that ultimately is the idea that uh, Kenda Nakai and Kanisha published a while ago, and that ultimately led to one of the best methods to predict from Paul Horton, PSORT. Uh, now, essentially what that says is that the amino acid composition relates to subcell localization. Why is that? Because we have different pH values, because different compartments have different biochemical conditions. And that is imprinted in the amino acid composition, right? And just let's see, and I'm sorry for the quality, there's just nothing I can do about it except for apologize. Uh, this is green is nuclear, 
Blue is extracellular, red is cytoplasmic. This is an eigenvector composition for the 20 amino acid composition. And you see that the somehow they cluster. So there's green here between two patches of red. Uh, but you somehow can possibly, even from where you sit, from where I stand, I can sort of see that there's a little bit blue, there's, there's blue, green, and red. So there's some clustering. It's not very good. But this is the point. Why would the entire protein be influenced by the environment? What of the protein would be influenced by the environment? Surface. The surface. So what would you look at? The same thing as surface composition. No, actually the first thing you would do is the other way around. Core. So if you believe it's the surface, begin to look at the core. The core is the opposite of the surface. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for the quality here. Believe me, there's absolutely no clustering signal whatsoever here. So even if the surface signal does not show you a clear clustering, this one shows you that the core is not it. This is absolutely not it. Uh, and sometimes this is, in fact, they are not necessarily one and uh, one minus the other. So you should, in a, in a situation like that, really try both. That really knocks out the idea. Uh, and somehow, again, if you had more, more quality here and if you counted, you would see that the clustering of red, cytoplasmic, nuclear green, uh, and blue extracellular is better here than here. But the major thing really is this is much worse. So that gives it away the strongest. Uh, here is a larger set, uh, a data set, and again, you begin to see that the clustering is uh, relatively good. And you also begin to su su suspect that there are things somewhere here, there are some points, where in the middle of a red cluster, you have blue or green. How could that happen? This is surface composition again. Well, you could imagine that you put on the surface uh, sugar, for instance. And when we look at the glycosylation, we saw that the biggest outliers in that set were exactly those. Where you immediately see that the sugar is a way to, in fact, simply biochemically mask that your protein should be in different compartments. Or that it is sort of in a, in a cancerous state. The first one we found was really cancerous case uh, where the glycosylation, in fact, was put to put it somewhere where it's not supposed to be, so to speak. Uh, when you look at the overall surface composition, you see the height of the letter is proportional to the number it's used. You see that, for instance, nuclear and cytoplasmic have a high K, but the R is where they differ. So these signatures look different, and they are unique for these three classes. Um, now, the problem with that is I need to be able to predict subcellular uh, solvent accessibility. So I need, if I wanted to use that signal, I have to predict surface. Uh, and surface, well, let's just say you can do it at a certain level of accuracy. Um, and by the way, here's another thing. Um, let me not gloss over this. Has anybody ever heard of CONSERV uh, from the group of Nir Bental at Tel Aviv University? No? So what CONSERV does is simply it colors when you have a known structure, it colors the conservation. So you have a known structure and a sequence alignment. And essentially, it simply puts onto the surface, onto the 3D structure, the conservation. So more conserved, more red. And it takes you seconds. I, OK, you see the DNA here, right? Uh, but even if you remove the DNA, and if somebody asked you, if I asked you, where do you put the DNA binding site? Well, maybe you put it like this. Uh, maybe you put it like this, but there will not be much of a second guessing where, where the binding site is, right? You immediately see from the conservation signal, uh, somehow the binding site jumps at you. And there's nothing put into it other than structure and conservation. Uh, it's an amazingly cool tool. It also works when you don't know the structure, and it's called CONSEC, obviously, because you don't quite know the surface. Uh, but you sort of predict aspects of it, and it's still very, very helpful. Whenever you have a structure, whenever you have uh, enough time to analyze one particular protein, you should apply those tools. OK, uh, back again to what I said before. Surface, 
it is getting the signal. If that is getting the signal, how can I derive a machine learning device that uses it? So the simplest would be amino acid composition. Now we essentially would use more than amino acid composition. We would use surface composition. Uh, Rajesh Nair did that. Uh, and unfortunately, when Rajesh did his uh, work a few years after what I showed you before, the, the clustering between this and this was no longer as dramatically different. We never really figured out why. Um, we could still sort of use surface or solvent exposure to predict um, subcellular organization in machine learning. Uh, briefly, neural networks, there's an input, there's an output. Essentially, there's a value of this unit here. Uh, there's connection. The way they are computed is you take the value here, the one, multiply it with the strength. That's the value that comes in here. You sum the two input values here, so this times this plus this times that, that comes in here. Ultimately, what you do is you multiply two vectors. Two vectors is a projection in a geometric way, uh, and then you apply a threshold function. It's a sigmoid, so very, very high positive values are one, very high negative values are zero, and there are different sigmoid functions you can apply. This is the hyperbolic entanglement is just one of them. Uh, and ultimately, in this language, this means you ask whether or not this is beyond, uh, higher than a certain threshold or not. If yes, you say one, if not, you say zero, somewhere in between, right? The way the system works, is it can classify open, open and dark circles. So let's say the dark circle is classified as one and zero in my input vector. I initialize by random here my connections and I get a certain output by the computation. The error is what I want to be out. Say I want they, this dark circle should be a one and this should be a zero here. Then I simply can see how much that connection contributes to the error. Because the only thing I can change the input is given, the output is given, the only thing I can change is the connection, and I would change the connection such that the error is getting less. I do the square to make it sign independent, uh, and then error less in, in, a, in a mathematical sense is you, go, you do gradient descent, you go down in the landscape of errors, so you change your connection such that the error decreases. Uh, and you do that step by step in iterations, and this is the way you train a network. By that, you can introduce sort of lines in this space. You can separate out these points. How can you separate these points with a line? Anybody can propose a line that separates the open and uh, closed circles? In higher dimension. Hmm? In higher dimension. No. Yes, that is correct what you say. But the line here. Very simple. Yeah, yeah, you got it right. <laughs> Is that what you meant? Yeah, both of you. Uh, I never said straight line, right? But anyway, so in the language of the neural network, it's only it allows only straight lines. So I'm cheating. The network cannot do that. The way it can do that with straight lines is by using two lines in the network analogy, in the network language. You introduce new lines by having another layer. Refer to as the hidden layer. Input is what you see, is real world. Output is what you see, is real world. Hidden is just computation in between. The idea of a line, so I said I introduce another line by another layer. This is very misleading. Ultimately, you incre increase the dimensionality of the problem and you essentially get to a higher dimension by having more points in the hidden layer. Okay. Uh, now, again, in, this, in the computation, oops, I should have done that here. Uh, on the computation, you do the same. So you multiply this times that, uh, plus this times that, and then the tangents of abolicos, and then the same thing, right? It's the same equation. The way the error is compiled is the same way. You still go down the hill in the error, meaning that is essentially the error. Uh, you look at the derivative of the error with respect to the connections. So the change at the, the next time point is proportional to reduce the error downhill. That's why it's a minus here. You get to go a little bit downhill. This term here just allows you to go over local minima. You, do, you integrate a step from, from time step before that allows you to jump a little bit up. That very, very, very trivial. Um, the math is totally trivial in this. Uh, over training time, that's the training set, and typically that's the sort of a holdout set, test set often. 
refer to and you may observe something such as this. Uh, at this point, I overtrain. Overtrain means, what does it mean? It's sort of trivial. Just what does this point? Why is blue saturating? Let me go back. Green as my training data set. So the green data set is the one that I use to reduce the error. So when I said I go down in the error space, downhill in the error space, I always use red, uh, green. Blue is a different data set. I haven't used to optimize. Why do I need the, the blue one at all? Yes, and another way of, of saying overtrain is overfitting. Yes. Uh, in, what, what are, yeah? Maybe like that doesn't get too specific for your training Exactly. So you're all saying the right thing. So essentially, what, what, what I mean is the, I hope that my machine learning problem or my machine learning solution will work for the problem tomorrow, not the problem today. So I have the holdout set to estimate how the data from tomorrow will look. And I hope that it sort of extracts some generic features of my problem. And overfitting means, becoming too specific means, overtraining all mean the same thing. They essentially mean that from this point onwards, I only learn what's specific to the training set. So the training set still goes up, but it's what I learned on top there is only relevant for that data set. That's why it's overfitting, overtraining. I use too many parameters. I, I'm becoming too specific to the green, not any more generic for the blue. And that is the big, big problem in machine learning. Uh, that making this, uh, working out where this point is, is highly, highly, highly non-trivial. Uh, here's another point that I want to show why that is non-trivial. So this is a neural network that predicts secondary structure. Uh, for secondary structure, this is what was the green here, that's the train set, and that's the test set, that's the blue. Uh, so there is no big, you know, okay, you may argue that there is some maximum here. And that in fact, this is the point at which you should stop. But you immediately see from the real life data here, it's nowhere near what I showed you before. Uh, and you could argue that maybe this point is the best, maybe this point is the best, maybe this point is the best. Uh, you could simply, numerically it's clear, it's this one here. Uh, but you immediately see from this curve, it's not that simple, right? Uh, so at least for this data set here, for the training set, you can still learn. So maybe one later point is in fact better. And exactly where you stop, early, that's what people refer to as early staining, and how you do that, we will get back to in some other point. Now what's the major difference between a neural network and an SVM? Have you heard of SVM, support vector machines? So often the way they're classified is you transform the problem into a different problem, which is the same, so you project it into a higher, higher order landscape. It's the same between neural network and SVM. Uh, it's just typically, an SVM begins by explaining, so it comes from Babnik, uh, it begins uh, in explaining what it is with this graph. Again, it's the same for a neural network, except for the SVM really has an explicit function here. And the neural network is the number of hidden units, that is an implicit function. Uh, whatever, other than that, it's the same. But where the difference is, is shown on this. So this line here uh, is the one that is supported by the data. Typically, the, SVM, the philosophy of the SVM is, okay, these red points here, and these green points, they are very far apart. Classifying them is trivial. We don't need machine learning for that, or we, we can use a neural network or anything. Uh, tricky are the ones that are close to each other. The ones that are close, yet classified in two different red and green in this particular case here. Um, so that means it will only build the optimal line through the ones that are closest. So through the four, in this particular case, we have four points that I marked and it will find this, the line that optimally distinguishes between these four points. With that, you immediately see the strength and the weakness of the SCM. What is the strength? It's very good, like, for us applying things that are clearly separable. <coughs> 
You way, 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 way ahead. I mean, I, let, 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 let's, gloss, let's gloss over your answer, because I could understand your answer in both directions. Um, but one thing that's obvious, right? You throw a lot of points away, meaning you need fewer points. Okay, that's the beauty. You can uh, do machine learning on much smaller data set. And incidentally, for subset localization, the data set is small, relatively small. So this is something that potentially is interesting for us. Uh, but what's, what's the problem that you immediately see? Think about biology. Think about noise. Think about mistakes. Is it obvious? Is it too obvious? Exactly. So you're looking for the ones that have a different color and are most similar to each other. Now, every error will exactly be that condition, right? It will fall exactly into any, any mis mislabeled red point will fall exactly into the red cloud because it's a mistake, right? And then your SVM will exactly zoom into these mistakes and try the mistaken red to distinguish the, say, there would be a red one here. It will try everything to have this mistaken red classified as red and would change the curve in a way that is totally wrong. So suddenly it would not only be problematic with errors, it would zoom into the error. The error would become some of the most important things because those are the closest ones, right? Or maybe the closest one. Uh, so that's the danger. The SVM works very well if you have a clean data set and can live with very, very few data points. When you have a very noisy data set, you need new networks. That ultimately is the, the uh, uh, point. Therese, does anybody know, I've seen her only one of these courses, does anybody in the group know her? Yeah, yeah she, she, she actually is in the course, but she just had just, some just, other... Yeah. Um, so, I very much liked her, her slides that she introduced in some seminar uh, to explain machine learning. And the machine learning idea really is uh, get the best wake-up time. Uh, and you predict the wake-up time simply by arguing, I'm going to look for a week, I'm going to see how many hours uh, have I been awake on the last day, and that tells me how easy it is for me to wake up in the morning. So this thing rings, and I'm happy or not happy. Right? That's the readout, that's the output. Uh, and so now you look at data, and you know sometimes you're right, and sometimes you're wrong. So somehow the, there, there is a clustering, but obviously the clustering is not enough. So what do you do? You think of something else that may explain the data. For instance, how do you measure that? Yes, so be careful. Now you, you say my happiness in the morning of waking up is a good input for my happiness in the morning of waking up. But it's a little bit circular. So we need input that is not circular. Tiredness, I would take, is, my, is, is one minus happiness or something like that. So what else could be the reason? So the wake up of the last day, what else could be? Oh God. Huh? Time to sleep. Yes, that's for, when I saw her slides first, I was, wait a minute, this is not important. For me, it's much more important how much I slept, right? Uh, and then ultimately, in, in this language here, essentially what you do is you do two different input values. And that's the entire idea of machine learning. You think about other reasons why what you observe could have happened, and you have a, a device, a machine learning device, that allows you to simply add input features. As long as you have enough data, you can add away. And the machine learning will simply ignore things that do not matter. If you don't have enough data, it's a little bit complicated because then you have to be a little more careful what you add. But ultimately you see how in this way, in a simple way, you can immediately sort of get, get to a better solution uh, by adding data and the rest of the mechanism behind it. Um, now, here's one aspect, uh, another aspect of the difference between... No, no, I'm sorry, I'm late. Um, but this is an aspect that Tanya will talk about. Let me just finish that sentence. Uh, SVMs essentially are binary. They can classify only two points. While neural networks could have different number of input units, so in this particular output units, in this particular case, it could classify three states. 
easily, and that is not binary. That is another issue, and that pertains to subset organization. Thanks so much for your attention.